<laughs> Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Detroit Institute of Arts Thursdays at the Museum program. I'm Amanda Harrison Keithley, a Community Engagement Manager for the DIA. Thank you for joining us today. This program is Into the Garden, Part 2. During the program, I'd like to encourage you to please ask questions. You can do this by selecting the Q&A icon on the right-hand side of your screen. Type your question into the Compose box and then select Send. This event is being recorded, so if you'd like to watch it again later, you can find a link on our Facebook page and our YouTube page. Today's program hosts are trained docents, Cindy Patrick, Kathleen McBroom, and Howard Rosenberg. Please give our hosts a warm welcome. Hello everyone, I'm Cindy Patrick. I am starting my 15th year as a docent at the DIA. I've served as chair and vice chair on our docent committee, and I'm also a member of the DIA's education committee. Hello, Kathleen, are you there? Hi. I'm so sorry. Hello, everyone. My name is Kathleen McBroom, and I've been a docent at the DIA for about three years, and I am also a chair of our docent programs committee. Hi, everybody. I'm Howard Rosenberg. I'm back again. You can't get rid of me. Um, it's a pleasure to be here today, and uh, we're going to do part two of In the Garden. Part two of In the Garden is a continuation of our special talk that we started last week and we'll be finishing next week. And if those of you that were with us last week will remember, we talked about why people love animals and pets and why they garden so much and they just seem to enjoy that. And artists have also spent a lot of time with that themselves. Artists throughout history have painted scenes of gardens and animals and flowers and they've sculpted these things and today we're going to look at a number of the pieces and we're going to talk about the meanings behind them the hidden symbology and we're going to have a little bit of fun so let's get started uh, with our first piece which is called virgin of the rose garden and it was painted somewhere around 1475 to 1480. We're not quite sure exactly when. And not only that, but if you see, it was painted by an artist that we call the master of the St. Lucy legend, which is sort of like the artist formerly known as Prince, because we actually don't know who the artist's name was, but we do know that he painted the St. Lucy altar which is a very famous altar, which we're not going to talk about today. But the art connoisseurs, the art curators have identified this painting as being painted by the same artist as that person. So that's why we have that name. So if you're wondering why we don't have a name, that's why. So let's look at this piece uh, together. Well, let's look. There's a lot of stuff going on here. So Catherine, are you there? Are you with us, Catherine? Yes, I am. All right, all right, Kathleen. So let's start by looking at this painting, going from the top to the bottom, side to side. Take a moment, look at it together. And then Kathleen, tell me, what do you see? What do you notice? Well, as you said, Howard, there's an awful lot going on in this painting. Uh, the first thing I guess I notice are the five women. And I'm assuming that the woman in the center who is holding the baby I'm assuming that's Mary holding Jesus. She's wearing the traditional red and blue. Don't know who the other four women are at this point, however. Um, if, I, if I go all the way up to the top, I see there are two angels up there and they're holding a crown. So this really makes me think with the angels that it probably is Mary and Jesus. Now, Howard, I can't help noticing in the background, there is a very detailed city. I mean, you can see the ramparts, you can see the walls, you can see all sorts of individual buildings. So that is a very, very detailed um, rendering of, of some city or another. Thanks, Catherine. Okay, and then and the- What else? Did you have something else? 
Oh, I was just going to add that the whole setting, of course, they seem to be in this beautiful green lush garden. And yeah. there seems to be all sorts of plants and flowers and trees. So as I said, a lot going on. And do you notice how, Kathleen, do you notice how the garden is enclosing everything? Mm -hmm. It's covering everything. There doesn't seem to be a way to get out of this garden. So we're going to talk about the garden. We're going to talk about why it's enclosed. But there's so much going on here that first, let's talk a little bit about about the people that are populating this garden and about the, the town behind it. So we have the artist, the master of the St. Lucie legends, got three different things going on here. He's got right at the beginning of the common era, he's got uh, the Virgin and Mary and the baby Jesus. He's got, he's got from the 1100s to the 1300s, four women who are saints who have been sainted um, all been martyred. And then in the background, he's got a modern city, modern to him from 1475. And this is Bruges, a town in Belgium right now. And you can see the tall tower is the church and the shorter one is the cloth mart. Bruges was known for its tapestries, for its cloth, very rich city. So he was combining all three areas, but mostly what he was talking about was this garden. Now, what do we know about gardens, Kathleen? We know that there was a garden termed Eden, wasn't there? And that garden was the first garden of paradise. And so he is replicating this garden, this enclosed garden, and an enclosed garden symbolizes the purity of the Virgin Mary, symbolizes um, how she is pure and, and heavenly, which is symbolized by the angels holding this crown because when Mary ascends to heaven, she will be crowned the queen of heaven. And she's surrounded by four women who are all martyrs. And these women are Catherine, Catherine Barbara, Ursula, and I'm sorry, this is Ursula, Cecilia, Barbara, and Catherine. Again, Catherine, Barbara, Cecilia, and, Urs and Ursula. So you have here, what do you notice about this, Kathleen? Well, it looks like Jesus is giving something to Catherine. It looks like maybe he's putting a ring on her finger even. He is putting a ring on her finger. He is, Catherine, when she was being martyred, had a vision that she symbolically was married to Jesus. And so this artist is representing that by Jesus putting a ring on her finger. And you're watching the Virgin having a look at that. I'm not sure what she's thinking about it, but she's clearly having a look at it. So here we have in the garden, we have two things. We have roses and we have strawberries. So artists throughout the ages have used flowers and fruits to represent lots of different things. And roses are represent Roses are representative of, uh, hang on one second while I move this back. Roses are representative of paradise, but they're also representative of thorns because roses have grown thorns. And so roses are predictive of the, of the loss of Jesus, of the martyrdom of Jesus. And they and the roses symbolize the fall from grace with the thorns. They also are so beautiful and fragrant that they also remind you of the garden. And then strawberries are symbols of perfect righteousness. They represent your good works on earth and the fruits of the Holy Spirit. And, and Mary um, is associated with roses as she is the spouse of the Holy Spirit. So you have those representations, and that's what artists in the uh, Middle Ages and in the Renaissance did. They would talk about those different things. Here you see um, you have Ursula down here, and Ursula was martyred by arrows. So you can see a little arrow down here. And then over here you have Cecilia, um, who is the patron saint of musicians. And up here you have Barbara, and she's holding a flower, which is a symbol of her escape from the tower that her father had placed her in. Hey, Christine. 
Are there any questions? No, Howard, there was a comment though that uh, the viewer really is enjoying the color palette here. Ah, yes, he did a nice job with that. It, greens are so difficult too, and so to represent things in greens, um, it's done a nice job, really nice. And uh, the depth that they've created in here without, you know, it's tough because you enclose a garden, you don't get any perspective, you don't get any way into the painting, and you still can, you can still see it. So they did that. So now we're going to move on to a more modern piece. And uh, I believe that Kathleen is going to be talking about this piece. Indeed. Thank you, Howard. Uh, we're moving from uh, Mary and Jesus and Saints to an old peasant woman. And this was painted by a German artist. Her name was Paula Motorschen Becker, and she painted this about 1905. And she did a whole series of paintings of peasants. Uh, she lived in the city of Bremen, and she used a lot of subjects, uh, peasants who lived in the villages around her. And she liked to paint portraits or pictures of the peasants because she thought that they lived a very uh, life, a very simple life that had been distilled down to kind of the essence, that they were very close to the earth and they lived a very natural, pure life. Now, Cindy, we've included this in our In the Garden presentation. And Cindy, what do you see in this painting that makes you think that maybe, you know, why, why would this be in the In the Garden? She's thinking, she's Kathleen. Thinking. I'm, sure she's, I'm sure she's gonna give you an answer sometime. Okay. Oh. Can hey, you Cindy? hear me now? <laughs> Hi, Cindy. Yes. Sorry about that. And I'm sorry that I advanced the presentation. I was trying to unmute myself and I made a mistake. Sorry, everybody. Anyway, if you look at the background in this one, um, it kind of looks like it might be leaves on a vine of some sort. And then I noticed that in her lap in front of her are some, there's like a little sprig of yellow flowers. So I'm assuming that's why it's a part of this, uh, this presentation. Yeah, thank you, Cindy. Um, you're, you're right. The background is kind of indistinct and it in, evokes, like you said, like foliage, like trees or leaves or something. But down in her lap, kind of fallen away, we have this little pop of yellow. It's the pop of color and they're little tiny yellow primroses. And before we move on, if you take a look at the position that the woman is, woman is sitting in, Motorshin Becker always portrayed her subjects with, with a dignity and with empathy. And she has this woman posing with her hands crossed up on her breast. And those of you who are familiar with paintings that were done of the um, Virgin Mary when she was accepting her fate, when the arch, archangel appeared to her and told her that she was going to become the mother of Jesus, she was almost always portrayed with her arms like this. It's a symbol of acceptance. It's a symbol of, you know, God's will. So we see this woman and then down in her lap, there are these little yellow flowers that have, you know, just, just kind of almost tumbling off her lap. Um, Cindy, can we go to the next slide, please? Yeah, these shows us what the flowers are. They're these bright yellow primroses. And primroses are very small, delicate little flowers, and they are associated with youth. They're the symbol of youth. And so when we look at the old peasant woman, we know that it's like her youth is kind of falling away and she has accepted this. That's why she has her hands crossed. She is aware of the cycle of life and her youth is behind her and probably middle age, motherhood is probably behind her. And now she's entering the final phase of her life and she has accepted this. And one last thing about the painting I'd like to point out is that if you look around um, her head, um, Motorshin Becker tended to paint these peasants using large blocks of color, some kind of a muted palette and she's included almost kind of an aura around the woman. Again, just to point out her, her elegant and her dignity and, and how she kind of stands out. And Cindy, if we can advance the slides, a couple of them, we have a photograph of Paula Motorschenbecker. 
And this was taken shortly before her death. Unfortunately, she she died very young. She only lived to be 31. So we are very fortunate that we have one of her paintings in our collection. Uh, Christine, are there any questions? Uh, yes, uh, can you go back to the painting? Okay, one of the um, one of the viewers said that it looks to them like perhaps she could be sitting uh, inside with a window in front of a window and and maybe the um, the garden is behind her head on the outside. And then another person said that it looks like she's surrounded by a halo. Yes, kind of an aura. And I don't know if Morrison Becker would have called it a halo, but as I said, she just she had such empathy and sympathy and just really sought to find the essence of these, these peasants who lived these simple lives. And she really kind of wanted to glorify their relation to nature and just the worth of their lives. So any other questions or comments? No, thank you, Kathleen. OK, well, now we're going to move on to something entirely different. So Cindy, take it away. So Howard, how are you doing so far with all this girl power all around you? Oh yeah, I'm all right. I miss Ray a little bit, but I'm okay. Hey, you know, something else I noticed is that you often talk with your hands. I do. And I was wondering, do you have your bullet points written all over your fingers? Yeah, right here in between. That's how you <laughs> take tests in high school. Howard, would you mind taking a look at this next painting of Virgin and Child with Angels and tell me what you see? Well, Cindy, I don't see any garden, I'll tell you that. I mean, I don't know what the heck's going on here, but I do see what appears to be a blue and red angels with wings. So that's giving me the sense that they're angels. You know, they have that halo, that golden halo around them. Then I see the Virgin. We know it's the Virgin because of the blue. And I see baby Jesus giving his blessing. And he's holding a little bird in his hand. Thanks, Howard. So you've noticed that there's a bird in Jesus' hand, and we're going to get back to that in a minute. And that is the legend that's uh, inclusive of our theme today. But before we go there, we're going to talk a little bit about the star, the halos, and the angels. So if you'll notice on um, above Mary's head, she has a, a gold golden halo, and in it there is a Latin inscription. And I'm not going to try to pronounce the Latin, but the translation into English is Hail Mary, full of grace. And then if you'll notice on Jesus above his head, there's another halo and it has YHXXPS. That's sort of a Latinized Greek, and that is just simply his name, Jesus Christ. Now, if you take a look at her right, would be her right shoulder, it's on our left, you can see there's this little star. That stands for, um, in Latin, it's, she is known as Stella Maris, which is Latin for Star of the Sea, Port of Our Salvation, also known as Queen of the Heavens. And it was quite some time before, as a new docent, I noticed that this star appeared on many of the paintings from the Renaissance of the Virgin Mary. I completely missed it until you know we were in training one day and someone pointed it out and then from there on forward every single um painting of mary i was always searching for that star and it appears often then if you'll notice her her clothing she's sumptuously dressed the in interior of her uh, cape is ermine you can see the little black ermine tails and then across uh her neckline and on her cuffs. These are beautiful jewels that have been attached to her clothing. And then the whole thing is uh, woven with gold thread. So very luscious, sumptuous clothing. Now I want to talk a little bit about the angels that you mentioned in the background. And you know, uh, Howard, when you were talking about uh, Mary in the Rose Garden, I noticed at the top there were two angels and one of them happened to be 
uh, a shade of blue and the other one happened to be a shade of red. So I want to talk a little bit about the difference between the blue and the red. Um, the red angels are called seraphim and they are in per perpetual adoration of God. The blue angels are cherubim and their job is to govern the stars and the elements. And I don't know if you've, if you look closely, you'll notice they have one set of wings covering the front of them. They have another set of wings that are at their shoulders and then they have an extended set of wings. And this is frequently seen um, in Renaissance art. So the set of wings that are covering the front of them are meant to cover their feet. The set of wings that are at their shoulders are to cover their face. And the last set of wings behind them are the wings that they use to take flight. This painting is about 26 by 20. It's not really that large, but at one time the original was larger. Somewhere along the way it was cropped down a little bit, maybe to fit into a different frame. And that's why the background with all these figures seems a little bit more congested than it might have originally been. It was uh, uh, used as a side altar piece. It wouldn't have been seen by the public. It was only for the use of the clergy. And I want you to notice all of the gold leaf that's on here, the edging around her cloak, around all the halos, and you can't see the frame here, but it's got a very elaborate frame. So this maximum amount of gold leaf applied to the painting in the frame uh, was there to create a reflective surface. Because if you think about it, this painting in 1460 was in a church that only had candlelight. So it was important that it had a reflective surface so that it could capture uh, whatever little bit of light there was. Uh, Gazzoli was a Renaissance artist. He was highly sought after. He, he did works that were uh, in the Vatican. And even today there is a Gazzoli Museum uh, in Italy. Last of all, I wanna talk a little bit about how this was painted. It's something called egg tempera and it's painted on a wooden board. Egg tempera was the medium that was used by painters up until around 1500, and that was when they, I don't know if that was when they actually introduced or, or learned about oil painting, but prior to 1500, most everything was done in egg tempera. So the egg yolk was the binder that binded the pigment to the surface. And if you, if you can imagine cracking open an egg and trying to separate the white from the yolk, and then they actually had to pierce the yolk with a, something sharp like a pin and just let the interior of it uh, ooze out. And that was what they used to mix with the pigments. They had to get rid of that little membrane that surrounds the yolk. And the pigments were made from crushed gemstones like perhaps lapis lazuli might have been one. And you can see that this was a very stable medium to paint in because the colors in this painting are still vibrant. You know, it was painted in 1460 and it's just as brilliant and bright as the day that it was painted. Uh, I think that's all I have to say about this one. If we have any questions, Christine. Uh, hey, hey uh, Cindy, I have a question. Yes. What about that bird? Oh my gosh, how did I leave out the bird? Good heavens, thank you. The <laughs> legend, I almost forgot the legend. So the legend is of the goldfinch and that's the small bird. And if we can advance, uh, uh, thank you, Howard. Uh, you can see that here's, a, here's an actual photograph of a goldfinch and you can see that it's got really colorful plumage. It has uh, this bright red on its face and then it has gold wings. And so in Jesus' hand, you can see this little tiny goldfinch. And honestly, unless someone points it out to you like Howard just did, it's pretty easy to overlook because in the painting, it's quite small. If we can go back. So the legend is that as uh, Jesus was carrying the cross uh, to Calvary, this goldfinch fluttered above his head and actually came down and mercifully plucked one of the thorns from his crown, from his brow. And a, a small speck of blood 
stain the bird's face. The spot of red uh, on his face, along with his gold wings, can be seen in the photograph. So I want you to just imagine if you saw this fragile bird flying across, flashing these red face and these gold wings in a in brilliant sun. And he was so colorful and so beautiful that he was often kept as a pet. So perhaps in this painting, he might have actually been tamed and been considered to be a pet. OK, thanks, Howard. Yep, I got one more thing. Yes. So you know how you, you mentioned that uh, Mary generally has a star painted on her? On the Virgin in the Rose Garden, do you think there was a star there? I did not notice one. I didn't I didn't notice one either. But if you look at the top, you'll see that we have a seraphim and a cherubim. Yeah, I see. Red, blue. So which is which? Uh, the blue is a cherubim and the red is the seraphim. Gotcha. And the is seraphim that, is considered to be a higher order of these angels. These only have one set of wings. Must well, have they're been. not always depicted with all six sets of wings, but often. Gotcha. Okay. Now that we're done with all of Howard's questions, Christine, do we have any questions from, the, from our viewers? Uh, there was a question in regard to um, the symbolism of red and blue and why is Mary depicted in red and blue? You know, I don't know the answer to that question. Can anyone else offer? I'm sorry, I don't know the answer to that. There so was one other little thing I wanted to add, though. I want, since some of the folks who are on today might be from Detroit or around Detroit, I wanted to let them know that this painting was a bequest from Eleanor Clay Ford, and it was in her own personal collection, and upon her death, it came to the DIA. And, you know, Cindy, the, the, um, in the 1400s before and even after, um, artist convention was, they chose the colors red and blue and gold to depict Mary because, you know, most people were illiterate, they couldn't read, so um, if a viewer, if someone was looking at a painting and saw those colors, they would know that was Mary, Queen of Heavens or the Virgin Mary. So that was their visual cue to know who they were looking at and that it was someone important. Yeah, and to be able to identify, you know, what her identity is. Yeah. And Thanks. in addition, the lapis lazuli was so expensive and so highly in demand and considered that ultramarine color is considered so beautiful. Let's use it for the most important person, right? Makes sense. And this is Kathleen. I'm chiming in. Blue was the color of royalty and often represented Mary's ties to the earth. And then the red was the cover of her glorious um, ascent into heaven. And so the red and the blue also uh, used to represent that she reigned both on heaven and in earth. So. Since she is the queen of heaven. Yes. yes. Uh, with that, I would like to turn it over to Howard. Thank you, Cindy. So Cindy, don't, don't, uh, don't go far because we know how much you love this piece. We wanna talk about it together. This is a lot different from all the other pieces we've talked about so far, isn't it? And this is a contemporary piece by a contemporary artist who's actively working today. She's a uh, she's a, a art professor at the uh, Visual Art School at Columbia University. She has won a MacArthur Fellowship. Her name, Cindy, move your uh, cursor for a moment. Her name it, her name is uh, Sarah Z. If Cindy would get her cursor out of the way, you'd actually be able to see it. She is. Um, Not compliant. <laughs> she is. Um, she does these large installations, these large sculptures that she wants to engage the viewer in. She wants the viewer to be part of the sculpture. She wants the viewer to see the sculpture, and she wants the viewer to interact with it, not touch it so much as be part of the space of it. So this is a small part of a larger sculpture, but it works by itself as, as her vision. So it's called Sextant from Triple Point of Water. So the Triple Point of Water, this is a sextant part from a larger piece called Triple Point of Water. And Triple Point of Water refers to <clears throat> uh, a, a chemical environment where water can exist 
in all three of its sec of its chemical stages: liquid, uh, gas, vapor, and ice hard. So it can go from ice quickly to liquid and right to vapor, right to steam. And so she's showing you that you have everything put together. So let's talk about this together, Cindy. Look at this piece and, and try to deconstruct it for me. Tell me what it is that you're noticing. Well, when I first looked at it, I was wondering what the heck it was. Right, um, right, we all do. And as I'm looking at it, uh, if I start at the top, I see what look like branches that extend from the top all the way down to the root ball at the bottom and they're painted kind of a bright orange. I see what looks like a couple of aquariums stacked on top of each other. I see some found objects that look like paper plates, a goblet, looks like maybe some pieces of styrofoam that have been stacked up. And then toward the bottom third of it, I see what looks like it might be AstroTurf. AstroTurf, and way at the bottom. And then at the very bottom, I see that awful looking extension cord. Right, and so you think they went to museum when it was installing it, install it in a way that was better than that. That's that's our first thought. So let's let, get a little closer look. So here's a closer look of the centerpiece. So we're going to get a, a closer look of this piece there for a moment. And then I'm going to show you the entire piece, the entire installation. So that was the gigantic installation that she did. You can see the orange branches. You can see some of the other pieces. I don't have a close up of that. But we bought this smaller piece, installed it in our in our museum. And as you talked about each piece, the blue styrofoam cup as rubber, just like in the Virgin of the Rose Garden, each thing was symbolic. So the blue styrofoam cup is symbolic of the earth strata. The tree branches and root balls are orange. They're orange is a color of caution, warning us about what we're doing in the environment. The pump pumps bubbles up from the pump way at the bottom. I gotta go back up here. There's a pump way at the bottom that pumps water all the way up through things. That pump is talking about the triple point of water where it moves from one state of existence to another state of existence. Um, this whole thing talks about how our how we're sensitive to our environment. One slip and we can lose everything. And it's particularly showing the electrical cord. It wants you to see the cord. It wants you to see the extension cord. It wants you to understand how we're reliant on electricity and fossil fuels. It wants you to know any of that. It wants you to know that we're environmentally in danger, that we have, you know, false things that are astroturf, but real things that are moss. Plus we have to tend this piece of sculpture in order for it to work. We have to add water to it. We have to keep electricity going. We have to clean it. We have to be part of it. Um, so it's an interesting piece to talk about. It's an interesting piece to see. And she uses a lot of found objects to create it. Um, her name again is Sarah Z. She pronounces it Z. And she is a uh, professor of art at Columbia University in New York. She does a lot of these sculptural things. She was uh, chosen to represent the United States at the Venice Biennale in 2013, I believe. This is itself is a large piece. It's 96 inches high. Hey, Christine, are there any questions? Um, Howard, let me let take me you. Well, I've got a compliment for you. Oh, well, I, yes, please. The viewer said you're a Zoom rock star and they think you're fabulous. Tell my mother, uh, <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> well, well, I'll call your mother right afterward. Okay. All right, whoever said that, I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Hey, Howard. Yes, Cindy. Could you tell me a little bit more about triple point of water? So there's a state at which water can exist in all three of its um, various chemical states. So water freezes at 32 degrees Fahrenheit, then it's liquid, then it, then it becomes vapor at what, 212 degrees Fahrenheit. So let's do centigrade, zero and 100. But there's a point where it sublimates 
where you can get it, a chemist can get it to go from ice to steam. And then as it does that, it has to pass through water. So it has to pass through it, but it passes through it like that, just like a snap. And so any chemist out there can explain it in more detail. But her belief was that we exist in all three of our states. There's lots of different states we exist at, and we have to exist at everything at the same time. That's how delicate the environment is, to balance everything out so we can exist in all three of our states at the same time. Any other questions? So I think Kathleen is next. And Kathleen, you're going to talk about the sculpture. And Cindy, you're going to handle all the other changes, right? Oh boy, I don't know. This is Cindy oh. with the cursor. Could get wild. <laughs> okay, we'll see. Okay, Howard, I thought I was I was waiting to see how you were going to segue from the 2005 sculpture to this uh, 13th century statue of Parvati. Yeah, I, I segue by switching slides. I see that. Thank you. Thank you so much. So this is indeed a sculpture of Parvati and she is a Hindu goddess. And there are literally thousands of Hindu gods and goddesses. And uh, people can choose to uh, worship whoever they want to. Most do include one of the three main gods when they worship. And the three main gods, there is Brahma and he is the creator. And then there's Vishnu, he is the protector. And then there's Shiva, and Shiva is the destroyer. And Parvati here is the consort or the wife of Shiva, the destroyer. And she kind of balances out um, Shiva, where Shiva is the destroyer, Parvati is the nurturer. She is the goddess of fertility. Not just human fertility for um, mothers and babies and things, but also she is the goddess of fertility for the earth, the bounty of the earth, the goodness of the earth, the crops and the seasons and so on. And as you can see by this statue, she is always shown to be very feminine, feminine side of uh, Shiva, the destroyer. Now, Cindy, can you take a minute with me and let's begin at the very top of this and work our way down. And, and can you tell me what you see beginning way up there at the very tip top where your cursor is? Well, I noticed that she's wearing some kind of a headpiece and it looks like it might be covered with, I don't know, beads or jewels. Looks like she's got earrings on that are heavy and are actually kind of pulling her earlobes down. She's got uh, uh, arm bracelets on both of her arms and on her wrists and then she's wearing this jeweled girdle and it has uh, some tassels hanging down and then at the bottom it looks as if she is standing on some kind of a flower maybe and then I notice that there are four uh, rings on the base and Howard I'm going to ask you to advance it uh, when she's ready because I'm having trouble with my uh, mouse. Yeah, no problems. Problem. Yeah, I got it. Okay, okay thank you. Well, thank you, Cindy. That was very thorough. And um, you are correct. She has her hair in a rather elaborate updo, which is a sign of femininity. She is wearing very heavy dragon earrings. They're hard to see, but they're very ornate dragon earrings. And she has a neck plate on. And there is a cord, um, a mystical cord coming over her left shoulder and going across her body. That's a sign of her high caste and Brahmins. And as you said, she is adorned, even down on her feet. Um, she's wearing sandals that have jewels in them. Um, and it's almost a shame because when uh, people would look at Parvati, whether it was in a temple or if she was taken out on a uh, procession for a festival, because Cindy, you pointed out down at the bottom of the base, there are the four rings. And what would happen there is they would put poles through those rings because this statue, it's made out of a copper composite. It's only about three and a half feet high and it would often be taken off in procession for festivals. And so that's why it's mounted on the stand like this. Um, and oh, one more thing, Cindy, you pointed out, it looks like she's standing on a, on a flower of some kind. Howard, if we can see the next slide, please. Parvati is standing on a lotus. 
And this is what the lotus looks like in real life. And lotus, uh, the flowers are known throughout Southeast Asia and they are often pure white. They can be pink like this, they can be yellowish. You can see the little couple of little yellow petals down at the bottom. And lotus, sometimes colloquially, they're called swamp lilies. Um, they're called Indian beans. They have a number of names. But the lotus is known because it grows in, in like ponds and like swamps. And it roots down in the yucky muck and the mud at the very bottom of these ponds. And then when the flower makes its way to the surface, it blooms into this beautiful, beautiful flower. So out of the muck and the yuck, of the mud at the bottom, you get this beautiful flower. And so it is a sign of purity, but more importantly, it's a sign of divinity. And so here you have Parvati standing on the lotus flower. Now, Cindy, you took a long time. We went through the whole statue and we looked at all of um, the wonderful things we see on Parvati. And I mentioned um, that she was the consort of Shiva. So, Hari, can you go forward a couple slides? And we can see a painting. This comes from around 1800. And you can see that that is Shiva in blue. And he is much, much larger than Parvati because he's a much more important god. And he's supposed to be the destroyer. If you notice, he's wearing skulls. He's wearing a necklace of skulls around his neck. But when you look at this picture, you can see that Parvati and Shiva have a very loving relationship. And they're looking at each other because when they're shown together like this, or when it is a festival and they're in a procession and their statues are near each other, it is a sign of happy marriage. Okay, Parvati balances out Shiva. And if you look at Shiva, he has, as I said, he is adorned and so is Parvati. She has jewels on, she's wearing sumptuous cloth. The thing though, is that no one would ever notice all of those wonderful details on that statue because Hindu, in the Hindu religion, they believe that when you worship a God, whether it's a statue or a picture, you see the God and the God sees you. The God is actually present. And people believe that when they make offerings to the God, they are giving it directly to the God or the goddess. And if we can go to the next slide, please, Howard, we can see this is how Parvati would be seen in public. This is not, these photographs, unfortunately, are not our Parvati, they're other statues. But you can see um, over on the left where she's being carried on, up on men's shoulders in a procession. And she is draped in wonderful silks and sometimes jewels and just flowers are just garland and, garlands of flowers are piled around her neck and at her feet. Because again, these are offerings that are made directly to Parvati and she receives them. Over on the right, you can see how Parvati would look installed in a temple and it's the same thing there are all sorts of garlands of flowers and there are one two three four five silver cups that even have flowers kind of floating in them and many um hindu have home altars where they worship their gods and it's the same thing you will often see them bringing um offerings of flowers or sometimes incense or sometimes fruit and vegetables to them so, Parvati. Um, Christine, do we have any questions? No questions, just to compliment Kathleen on what a great job you're doing. Thank you very much. Oh, Kathleen, is your mom watching too? Yeah, it must be her mom watching. We're getting all these, these individual compliments on your performances here. Got my whole family lined up, yeah, okay. Now, Cindy, this, this is another flower, so let, let's take a look at this. Well, it's interesting that we're going from your whole garden of flowers bedecked on Parva Parvati to this simple, single, beautiful magnolia blossom. And the magnolia flower sort of looks like a lotus flower. However, the interior of the flower is a lot different. On a lotus, the female parts, which are the pistil and the stamen, are quite flat, but in a magnolia blossom, you can see that they protrude up uh, probably about a good good inch, I would say. And the flower is uh, is 
much more open than a lotus. And another difference between the two is that, of course, as you said, the lotus grows from a river bottom on the water and magnolias grow on either trees or shrubs. And believe it or not, a magnolia tree can live to be up to 100 years old. So this photograph is in simple black and white. It's been stripped down to the absolute simplest form. The flower is even cropped so that we're not seeing the entire flower, the edges of the petals. We're just honing in on that central portion of the flower. It has an aroma that is very sweet, like honey, and has kind of a lemony um, flavor to it. If anyone's ever actually stuck their nose into a magnolia, they'll know this. And going along with uh, the idea of Asian symbolism with flowers, the magnolia is a Chinese symbol for the yin of the yin and the yang, which is perfect female beauty and gentleness. So I'm wondering, Kathleen, do you think that this is perfectly beautiful? I think this is so, I mean, I'm, I'm just enraptured. The tendrils in the center, the details, and even though this, this photograph is black and white, uh, when I've seen magnolias, I've seen them, and they can be anywhere from like that pale, pale pink to that really deep, deep mauve. And um, it reminds me just a little bit of my lotus flower, but this is so much more, more detailed, and you can just really see how it is enveloping. Um, Cindy, though, how, how did they get the photograph? So, so well, our, yeah, our artist, close. Imogen Cunningham, she was a wife and a mother. And so during her childbearing years, when she had three little boys at home and two of them being twins, she was kind of tied to her house. So she took these photographs out in her own garden, which was what was available to her. And she did extensive studies of magnolias. And with each series, she honed in even more and, and got, they became simpler and more focused on the form of the flower as opposed to, as I said, showing the whole flower. Uh, she had kind of a funny little quote that she said about herself during that period of time in her life. She said, I had one hand in the dishpan and the other hand in the dark room. Uh, we look at this and we consider it to, to be a very contemporary looking photograph because of the way it's been cropped and the way she's honed in on the form. And yet here it was done back in 1924. Uh, she was extremely prolific. She took thousands of photographs um, and she actually studied to be, uh, she studied to be a chemist and she majored in chemistry in college purposefully so that she would understand and be able to apply chemistry to the exposure and enlarging of prints. And it was unusual for a woman to take on photography at this early point in time because photography you know had only been around for maybe 60 or 70 years and she started with one of those big wooden box cameras that had glass plates so i mean it was heavy and awkward and i mean she really had to work at it um, as time went on you know cameras became smaller and they were a little bit easy to work with but in the beginning it was it was a tough go for it wasn't considered to be a woman's medium um Sometimes she was asked what was her favorite photograph, and I think that her quote regarding that was, which photograph is my favorite? The one I'm going to take tomorrow. So she was always looking forward, always looking for the next creative outlet. Her career spans 70 years. I think she was in her 90s when she passed away, and I'm going to try to advance this. I'm having a little bit of trouble with my mouse. There we go. Uh, we have a self portrait of her on the right and on the left we included a portrait that she did of Frida Kahlo and some of you may know Frida Kahlo uh, as a female artist and she was the wife of Diego Rivera and that's sort of our Detroit connection because Diego Rivera did the Rivera court murals in the DIA. So their paths crossed um, in 30, 1931 when Rivera was working on the Pacific Stock Exchange murals. And so at that time, Imogen uh, was able to do this portrait of Frida. And Frida's comment about, well, you can see when you look at this, she's got a really intense gaze. You know, she's her eyes aren't offset. She's looking straight out at the viewer, almost 
in sort of a challenging way. And what Frida said about herself and what I think Imogen was able to capture, Frida said, I have a battlefield of suffering in my eyes. And so most of the, the self portraits and if we see photographs done by others, you'll see this very intense gaze on the part of Frida. Christine, do we have any questions? Um, there was a comment that um, the, the viewer noticed and was reminded of Georgia O'Keeffe and wondered uh, what their relationship was. And uh, I actually don't know that if they knew each other, but their styles are similar in some ways. I don't know if they knew each other, but I think they were working around the same time. So whether they influenced each other's work, I don't know. But George O'Keefe was another one who honed in and did intense close-ups of objects from nature. However, she paint, she was a painter rather than a photographer. That's right. OK, thank you. So Cindy, I think that we have time for one more. Um, so why don't we go to Reeds and Cranes and ask Kathleen to talk about this one. Back to Kathleen. <laughs> OK, so, so Cindy, I want you to come on a little trip with me. I want you to imagine that it is the 19th century and you and I are in Japan and we have been invited to someone's home for a very special celebration. Perhaps it's a wedding or perhaps it's an important birthday or the birth of a child or a grandchild. And we go there in the evening and it is dark and there are candles and there are lanterns and there's soft glow and the candles are flickering. And Cindy, we walk into this room and we see this magnificent screen. First thing we notice is that it is huge. It is almost six feet tall and it is 12 feet long. And it's, you know, the candles and just everything is kind of highlighting this. And so remember, Cindy, we're Japanese. And so we read from right to left. And so when you look at this beautiful screen and we know right away that it's something very rare and something very precious, tell me, what, what do you see when you look at the screen? Well, if I look at it from the very beginning of the foreground, I can see plant material, looks like some kind of grass or some kind of water type plant. And then I see these beautiful large birds, some are perched on two legs. I see one with only, only on one leg. Looks like one might be foraging. And then I see one, two, three, four, six of them that are in flight. And they're, it seems as if they're in various stages of flight so that, I don't know, maybe the artist wanted us to see that he could portray this bird from every single angle. Exactly, thanks, Cindy. The plants that you see, those are reeds. And reeds have been used in Japanese art for over a thousand years, and they are symbols of longevity. And the birds that you see, those are Mongolian cranes. And we can tell that they're Mongolian cranes because if you notice, they have a little bit of red on top of their head. And they also were signs of longevity, but particularly longevity, as I've said, for like marriages, for long, long marriages, or for long life when someone was born. And this beautiful screen was painted by a gentleman whose name was Suzuku Kiatsu, and he was a samurai. Now, Cindy, when I say the word samurai to you, what do you think of? Well, what I know of samurais is that they were warriors. Exactly. And so you would have a samurai who would be known for being a very strong, powerful, brave warrior. But it was also thought that the samurais had to balance their lives with a more artistic aesthetic. And so a lot of samurais either wrote poetry or calligraphy, or in this case with Suzuki Kiatsu, he was a painter. Now, one thing when we looked at the screen, Cindy, is that we mentioned the reeds and we mentioned the cranes, and then the rest of it is kind of gold background, just plain gold background. We don't have clouds, we don't have the sun or the moon or anything else. And that's because when Kiatsu painted this, he would have evoked the Japanese artistic principle of Ma. That's M-A, Ma. 
And that is the idea of stillness or emptiness. And you can see this throughout Japanese art. And it, there'll be areas of paintings where it is just open. It's just, it's like stillness for the viewers to kind of consider what is going on and what is not going on. Now, this was paint, this was painted, at least in the 19th century, which would have been the um, around Edo, Japan. This was painted during a time of relative peace and stability. And so the arts like this flourished. So when Suzuki Kiatsu painted this, um, and, and he did the Manchurian cranes and they're flying. And I should say that there is another screen that goes along with this because the screens were always painted in pairs. And I believe we have, yeah, here is the other one that he would have created. And you can see that in this other one, the cranes are airborne and they're kind of, you know, getting organized and taking off. Um, part of the symbology of this is as well is that as a samurai, um, uh, Suzuki Kiatsu would have followed the emperor as the emperor moved from north to south as he went from his various palaces and all of the members of the court would pack up and would faithfully follow along. And so this is what we have here. And, and Cindy, if we go back to our evening at this wonderful party, at some point, maybe after dinner was over, they might actually take these screens and move them around. These screens were big and they were beautiful, but they were made out of um, silk or paper painted and they were very lightweight and they did collapse like a fan and they would often be used to create small intimate spaces or smaller spaces. So maybe after dinner, we would go and they might fold it up and we would go into another room. So I, I think it would be a lovely evening surrounded by this important and just brilliant artwork, as I said, and imagine it flickering in the light on the other screen, the open space, the ma, to kind of give us time to reflect on what we were seeing. And really it would be a pretty memorable evening. Christine, are there any questions? There was a question about whether these screens are on view at the same time or how does uh, the DIA rotate them? Well, as I mentioned, these are usually painted on silk or paper and they are very, very delicate and they are very, very sensitive to light. So they are rotated in and out. Usually they just do one at a time. And um, that's the good thing about it. If you come and visit us uh, down at the DIA in the Asian galleries, you will often see a brand new screen. There's always going to be something new to look at. Any other questions, Christine? There was one last question and I don't know that we have the answer to it, but it was if when these were originally, you know, installed in, in a home, in, in um in japan would they have been you know viewed when would they have been viewed together would they be in a specific order um would the would the people who were enjoying them have discussions about them so a lot of uh, questions that i don't know if we have the answer to i know i know as i said it was important that everyone kind of balance their lives with art and then the other aspect, whether they were a samurai or a court official. And uh, I, I would think that these sort of screens would prompt a lot of conversation and thoughtful reflection. And because they're so versatile, um, they are delicate, it's true, but they could be folded up or they could be used in a number of different ways. So it would be it would have been lovely to be able to actually see these in someone's homes and experience it. So. Well, thank you, Kathleen, for setting that lovely mood at that dinner party. But now I'm hungry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it looks like we've come to the close of our hour. And on behalf of Kathleen Howard and myself, thank you for joining us today for Into the, Gar Into the Garden Part 2. Our next Thursdays at the Museum Talk will be Into the Garden Part 3, and that will be next Thursday, July 16th at 1 o'clock. And then two weeks from now on Thursday, we'll have the introduction of our new theme, Pop Art, and that'll be on July 23rd at 1 o'clock. 
Thank you everyone for joining us today and we appreciate all of your questions and comments. Bye everybody. Bye bye.